Undernutrition is, uh, in the context of starvation, probably one of the uh, most problematic uh, things that we deal with as human civilization. Uh, but uh, when we're looking at it from a scientific perspective, what really is it? So undernutrition technically is uh, a lack of micronutrient, macronutrients, uh, which are really calories, that's where you get it from your carbs, your fats, your proteins, uh, or a lack of micronutrients, which are your vitamins and minerals. Now for our purposes here, we are concerned about more of starvation. We talked about the vitamins and minerals in the other sections. Now we're looking at what happens when you don't get enough energy in for energy out uh, that you, you burn either through your uh, body processes, uh, your basal metabolic rate, uh, or the activity that you do. Uh, so uh, for our purposes, we're going to consider, consider undernutrition to be an inadequate consumption of macronutrients. So a good way to get an idea of how, uh, how heavy a person is, um, apart from looking at their height and weight, is to use a BMI scale. Now this is good for adults, and to some extent you can use it to, for kids, but for adults you can really just uh, use this. As long as they're not uh, really, really muscular um, or, you know, bodybuilder, uh, in that case, you know, you might have some reservations. Uh, but for the most part, for adults, this works pretty good. So a BMI of 18 to, 18 and a half to 25 is normal. So this is where, uh, this is where you should be. 25 to 30 is overweight, and then more than 30 is obese. And now when we're talking about undernutrition, these people are going to fall in this underweight category, less than 18.5. And BMI calculated is just your weight in kilograms uh, over divided by your height in meters squared. So here's your growth chart for boys and girls. And the way we do, uh, the, the way we do uh, whether or not somebody is overweight or obese in boys and girls and children is based on percentiles. So uh, anybody, uh, any boy or girl above the 85th, between the 85th and the 95th percentile is going to be considered overweight. And then any boy or girl above the 95th percentile is going to be considered obese. So under nutrition, uh, we can look at two things. One is wasting, and this is probably the most obvious sign of undernutrition. And this is a weight for age that's more than two standard deviants below the normal weight for a child that age. And this is a measure of acute malnutrition. So, for instance, if I stopped eating uh, today, two weeks from now, I would be a lot thinner. I would have lost probably a good 25 pounds. Uh, so that's a measure of acute malnutrition. Now, it can, you can also be chronically malnourished and be really thin. That certainly happens. But uh, weight, lo a low weight is more of a measure of acute malnutrition, whereas stunting, which is a height for age that's more than two standard deviants below the normal height for a child that age, is more of a measure of chronic malnutrition. So take somebody like me, for instance, even though my growth plates are presumably closed uh, by now, uh, if I stopped eating, I would remain the same height. Or if you took a, a nine-year-old child, don't do this, but if you took a nine-year-old child and they stopped eating for a week, they probably are not going to get any shorter, nor is their height really going to be that stunted that much. Now, if you have a child that is is malnourished for for an extended period of time for years and years and years on end uh, then that's going to affect their height so you can see how stunting which is height is a measure of chronic malnutrition whereas wasting a measurement of weight uh, function of weight is a measure of acute malnutrition Worldwide, approximately 20% of children under the age of 5 are uh, wasting, and 32% are stunted. Uh, the most immediate consequences of undernutrition is premature death, and uh, by one year of age, undernutrition is likely to 
uh, have caused significant damage that can affect future health, cognition, welfare, and well-being. And so this is something that we're really concerned about in the developing world, that if all these children are undernourished and they've got all these problems that can affect you know, how intelligent they can be, how much they can operate, um, what their future health is going to be, this really puts them in a, a weak position, not just now, but in the future. Uh, micronutrients that are of high concern in undernutrition, and really when we look, when we look at somebody who is not getting enough food in general, they're probably going to be deficient in many micronutrients, but the ones that are really of high concern in undernutrition is zinc. Uh, zinc is important during the rehydration and refeeding process, so when we go on to treat these patients. Uh, the urinary zinc level is proportional to the overall zinc status. Another one is iodine. Uh, and for reasons uh, mentioned when we talked about minerals, deficiency in iodine is going to result in a goiterous hypothyroidism. It can also lead to mental retardation, uh, which uh, is the two of those, uh, and then uh, uh, growth stunting. And so you put the two of those together, uh, that's what we knew as cretinism. You're not supposed to call it cretinism anymore, but I don't know why they like to change names so much. Anyhow, vitamin A. So vitamin A is something uh, that's definitely deficient in uh, a lot of uh, the, uh, the starving. And so this deficiency is going to uh, cause uh, night blindness or at least decreased adaptation to night, uh, keratinization of the cornea and conjunctiva and of the skin, and then also an increased susceptibility to GI infection. Then, as you probably know, if you're iron deficient, you're going to have a reduced synthesis of heme, which leads to a microcytic anemia. If you're deficient in folic acid, you're going to have a megaloblastic anemia. Sometimes you can have the two of those together, and you have what looks like a normocytic anemia, um, but you'll note on the smear that you have some cells that uh, are macrocytic and some cells that are microcytic. You have a really long red distribution width, so uh, don't forget about that. Uh, it's also important to remember that in the developing world, GI parasites can be contributing to and exacerbating the undernutrition. So when we get these kids in and treat them, uh, we definitely need to address any possible infection that they might have. Protein energy malnutrition is a life-threatening deficiency of macronutrients, which is practically always accompanied by deficiency of some of the micronutrients uh, but as far as when we're looking at protein energy malnutrition, uh, the most concerning thing is to keep these patients alive. And the, what we're going to be doing to keep them alive is giving them macronutrients. And then later we'll address any smaller problems that might exist. So in medical school, you probably learned these as marasmus and quashicor. And they used to be considered separate illnesses, but it's usually the case that one patient can have some manifestations of both, so they kind of have some overlap. The treatment is really pretty much the same, so it's worth remembering the features of marasmus and quashicor, um, but you're not necessarily going to diagnose a patient with marasmus or quashicor. You're just going to diagnose them with protein energy malnutrition, which is what both of these fall under. So marasmus is uh, weight loss and listlessness. Uh, unlike Kwashiorkor, uh, you have a loss of skin turgor and wrinkling. Uh, they have a simian facies, which is more of a, uh, of a, a cachectic, skinny uh, face. Uh, they have, uh, they're going to appear dehydrated. Uh, they tend to have constipation, although they can have starvation diarrhea in which just small uh, pieces of stool or tissue even uh, get uh, 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 sent out in the waste, uh, and they're usually it usually has a lot of mucus on it. The abdomen may be distended or flat. Uh, there's going to be low muscle tone uh, or hypotonia, and these uh, are a lot of times they're hypothermic too, and that's just they're trying, the body's trying to slow down the metabolic rate because it doesn't have the nutrients. So with Kwashiorkor, similarly, you're going to see weight. Uh, weight loss. But in Kwashiorkor, unlike Marasmus, you see more signs of edema, uh, flabby skin tissue, moon facies. So the, the face looks more like 
this looks like a fat kid, but it's not a fat kid. Uh, this is just edema. Um, so the patient will actually appear to be in volume overload as opposed to appear dehydrated. Um, there's also diarrhea and vomiting. Um, there's, uh, there can be hepatomegaly. Uh, then you can also have a loss of muscle tissue. And then dermatitis. So you can have hyperpigmentation uh, and desquamation. So there's a lot of similarities between these two, some differences. The best differences to remember is Quashicor has edema and moon facies. Marasmus has wrinkling and uh, they appear more dehydrated. It doesn't have edema. Other symptoms of malnutrition can be present. So uh, you can have uh, usually hypocalcemia is present. Uh, they may have a positive Chvostek or Trousseau sign. And you can also see skeletal deformities consistent with rickets, uh, so your rickitic rosary. Scurvy may be present too, so they may have some gum bleeding. Your initial approach is going to be pretty wide. Even though you know this is a child who's malnourished, what you want to first do is get a CBC looking for anemia uh, due to iron deficiency, folate, B12 deficiency. You also want to look at your white count to see if there's possibly an infection going on. Uh, you want to get a metabolic profile and also those other uh, electrolytes, calcium, magnesium, and phosphate, looking for electrolyte disturbances. You want to get thyroid function tests and you're looking for iodine deficiency. We're always concerned about iodine deficiency in a malnourished child. Uh, so if it is iodine deficiency, what will you expect to see? You'll expect to see a high TSH and a low T3, T4. You want to look for total protein. That's usually going to be low. You want to get stool studies looking for GI infections, and then other labs may be indicated based on the individual patient status. Management of protein energy malnutrition is phased, and it's phased to gradually transition the child into, uh, or the adult for that matter, into consuming food. Uh, and there's a really good reason for this. It's called refeeding syndrome. And refeeding syndrome uh, happens because your body has been starved so long that once you start getting food and getting nutrients, including, most importantly, phosphate, into your bloodstream, your cells are so starved from of ATP, they don't have any ATP because you haven't been getting any, in any phosphate, that your cells just open the floodgates and let all the phosphate in, and you develop a profound hypophosphatemia. And that can die. That that can kill you. Um, and you can get uh, you can get necrosis of various tissues. Um, you can get rhabdomyolysis. Uh, so uh, refeeding syndrome is what we're trying to pre pre prevent here. You would think, oh well, you know these kids are starving, so let's just give them a big meal. We don't do it that way. So the initial phase uh, during week one is to correct their dehydration. Preferably, we like to do this with PO fluids, but if for some reason they're not able to keep it down if they're vomiting, um, then you can do IV fluids. Uh, you want to check the hydration status regularly though. And the reason, of course, is because we're concerned about electrolytes. Uh, you'll also begin feeding them. You can use F75 or the ready-to-use food diet and we'll be giving them 80 to 100 kilocalories per kilogram per day. Uh, as far as adults, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure there's a maximum there. Uh, also, uh, as far as uh, just a uh, bedside manner, uh, you want to start with smaller and more frequent feeds and then phase up to larger and less frequent feeds as tolerated. Of course, you want to give antibiotics for any suspected infection and then frequent electrolyte checks with emphasis on frequent and carefully correct any imbalances. Now, from weeks two to six, uh, you uh, can you're going to continue to do nutrition. Uh, there's uh, if you're doing the F series, you can move on to F100, uh, which is a little bit different as far as the composure and the uh, nutrients that are in it. You could continue on the ready to use diet. Uh, the the two big differences, or the one big difference between the two of these is with the ready to use. It uh, it has a longer shelf life. Uh, but other than that, it's they're, they're pretty much similar. Um, at this point, uh, you're going to be giving them at least 100 kilocal kilocalories per kilogram per day. And then you can also st start iron replacement uh, starting at uh, week two of treatment. 
Uh, these children then can be discharged from an inpatient center and uh, after six weeks, and then they should continue a feeding protocol for catch-up growth. So these are the F uh, packets. They're just mixed in water or milk. Uh, they might be mixed in milk. I don't know. I've never used these. Just follow the instructions on the back. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this is all ready to go. So you don't even need to mix this with anything. So you see how uh, you just shake it and cut it open and squeeze and eat. So this might be a little bit easier for uh, for some populations where they don't have glasses or don't have a safe water source. Um, so that, that might be easier in some places. So refeeding syndrome, as we already talked about, is a complication of nutritional rehabilitation. It causes a severe hypophosphatemia that's going to cause weakness and neutrophil dysfunction. Your body might try to get phosphate from other sources, which includes breaking down muscle. That's going to lead to rhabdomyolysis. Uh, you can get arrhythmias uh, re resulting from the rhabdomyolysis because you'll get a hyperkalemia. Uh, you can also get seizures, altered mental status, and cardiorespiratory failure. Diagnosis is going to be based on the fact that uh, the patient has a very, very low serum phosphate in the setting of uh, nutritional rehabilitation. The treatment is going to be to administer thiamine and to replace phosphate, and you'll want to frequently check those phosphate levels. Noma is something, of course, we're never going to, we never see in this country, um, but uh, it is something that's related to protein energy malnutrition, and this is a rapidly progressive necrotizing, infectious, ulcerating gingival and perioral inflammation seen pretty much exclusively in PEM patients, and typically it's preceded by some sort of a more innocuous infection or uh, even a debilitating illness. So the symptoms of this include gingivitis, halitosis, fever, anemia, uh, but this, uh, this, uh, this necrotization just gets worse and worse and worse and eats the tissue around it. Uh, the treatment is to get on top of this ASAP, local wound care. Uh, you'll be giving the patient antibiotics, of course. Penicillin and metronidazole is good broad-spectrum coverage, and then treat the underlying malnutrition. So this is an example of Noma. So it starts in the inner mouth and then it kind of just works its way, works its way outward. You can see this patient here on the, on the left had uh, surgery done and you can see the, the surgical scar here. So uh, in case um, you want to do anything to help, uh, for every 5,000 ad clicks, which in case you don't notice, I do have ads before some of my videos. A lot of that money goes to uh, uh, goes to uh, some of the uh, uh, the editing that I have done for my videos uh, by some other physicians. Um, but uh, for every five thousand ad clicks I get on this uh, on this lecture, I will donate twenty dollars to the Hunger Project. So get on it. I'll see you next time.